Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by the ever steady, fantastic Ricardo Martinez. But more importantly today, we are interviewing Patrick Melder, the author of two books, um, one being The Christian Case for Bitcoin uh, and host of his own podcast, Mission Bitcoin Podcast, and the man behind Bitcoin Lake in Guatemala. So a lot going on there. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well, Lawrence. I thought you were going to say the myth behind the project in Guatemala. No, but I'm doing great. Um, thanks for having having me on and love to talk about my books and uh, the project down in Guatemala. It's uh, yeah, a lot going on, but when you develop a passion and uh, see something that needs to be fixed, especially in Bitcoin land, uh, we we tend to kind of go after it. And that's kind of what, what I've done with uh, actually both of these projects. Um, the, the, my writing, my, my podcast and, and the, the project down in, in Guatemala. But uh, yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I'm happy to chat about it. And uh, I think people listening already will be able to tell there's a, there's quite a lot for you to talk about and us to get into today. Uh, yeah, you're right. I should have said the man, the myth, the legend, but I didn't do it. <laughs> I missed out on an absolute opportunity, but never mind. It is what it is. Um, but I, I guess, yeah, I suppose my first, um, first question to get us off here is, um, who was Patrick before Bitcoin? How the hell did you find it? And what was life like before then? How did you find it? And then, yeah, like, I guess like, yeah, basically I want to hear your story, man. Like I want to hear the story. Cause obviously you, there's like, you know, the, the books there's, there's Guatemala. It's obviously you're not, well, I don't think you're from Guatemala originally, but I could be wrong. Um, didn't think so. So it's kind of like, Hey, I want to know what's going on. How did this come about? How did Bitcoin happen in your life? Great. Awesome. All right. So before the, these projects, I was a busy surgeon. I'm an ear, nose and throat surgeon by training and also a busy entrepreneur. I've, I've, uh, I've uh, started two companies. I have, uh, I don't know, 30 plus patents and um, was in practice in my, and as a surgeon for about 20 years and fell into Bitcoin in about um, 2018 and at the time, it was like I think for everybody when you first um, purchase Bitcoin, it, it's kind of an investment, and that's kind of what I was looking at it for. But I, I fundamentally understood when I first saw it that there was something unique about it. And for me, it was the the quote unquote blockchain aspect of it of of keeping record of stuff that I thought was very unique. And I was actually in Mexico the first time I bought Bitcoin and realizing that. Well, this could be a really transformational technology for people in developing countries. And at the time, I wasn't thinking as a monetary asset. I was just thinking the blockchain technology to keep track of, you know, property records. You know, if there's a civil war and you've got something on the blockchain that that codifies that you own a piece of land, then that would uh, provide some sort of property rights. So I had kind of a nascent understanding of, of property rights when I first came across Bitcoin. But as a a busy surgeon and running my own business, I just I just was overwhelmed and I kind of just forgot about it, dollar cost averaged into it. And it wasn't really until the end of uh, 2020 when I started, you know, like a lot of people, we had a lot of time on our hands um, to kind of think about things and read about things. And that's kind of when I started going down the, the rabbit hole of trying to understand what is Bitcoin. And even before that time, I was, I didn't know the term, but I was definitely a Bitcoin maxi because I had looked at other altcoins um, and I just decided just practically speaking that there's just, there's something special about Bitcoin and these other things just don't look like Bitcoin. So from a very pragmatic and practical viewpoint, I came to the conclusion that Bitcoin was kind of it before I became a an orange peeled maxi um, with reading everything and, and going down the proverbial rabbit hole. So that's kind of who I was before. And my nexus with Guatemala is, I was telling Ricardo before we started recording, when my girls were younger in middle school, high school, we would go down to Guatemala every year from 2012 to 2018. We had met a couple that went to our church and they were doing work down in Guatemala. And we wanted to introduce them to Christian mission and service and all that. And so every year we went down to 
uh, Lake Atitlan Panachel, where we're, we're now based with this project. And we did a, uh, an art camp and developed relationships, basically trust relationships. And that's who we kind of reconnected with when we wanted to kind of implement this, this program of, of Bitcoin Lake. And the, the whole idea of Bitcoin Lake was, was kind of coincident with me learning about Bitcoin Beach. But um, I think that the for me, as I was learning about Bitcoin and learning about um, what it could do for uh, developing countries as the savings technology, the freedom that it brings, um, you know, Alex Gladstein, his, his work really influenced my thinking about how Bitcoin could be used in a developing country. And as I was reading him, learned about Bitcoin Beach and then reflecting back on my time in Guatemala, I thought, wow, let's do a similar project down in Guatemala. So that's kind of how it all came together. And we started doing some planning and reconnected with Nancy, who, who owns the school, uh, Nancy Sifuentes, who owns the school that we work out of now, based the project out of. And we did a scouting trip back in December of last year, 2021. And then um, after that, we officially launched the, the project in January of this year. So it's very new, but I mean, we've had tremendous success and I'm, I'm passionate about it. And I'm, I've, I'll, I'm, I'll love to talk to you about what we've done so far and, and you know, what we've learned and, and what, what Bitcoin Beach has provided for us as well, as far as learning and, and real support. So that, that's, all, that's all kind of wound in there. Sounds like you've been up to, you've been up to a lot. You can kind of tell. And, and I think, um, well, something that's interesting to me is when we spoke to the Galloway guys, he spoke to uh, the guys on the ground at Bitcoin Beach before. Um, I've had like some private discussions with, I think it was the Bitcoin Beach Brazil before um, in Jericho. Wow. I can't say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wherever that is. Uh, I think it's in the north of Brazil. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, each, in the, each of these occasions, it's always people who, uh, already have been or are or whatever doing things around community projects anyway and are already trying to help an area and they're like okay well this is a way for to kind of in, sort of strengthen the local community and help people uh kind of get bring more independence to the people actually in the community like if they can start accepting the bitcoin and they can then profit and generate from that and so it's often people who are already doing something good that just see this as an opportunity to hey make it even better for the people there which is pretty damn cool uh for sure i mean you said about the bitcoin beach guys is get I, I shoot i understand you guys are working with galloy to like and use the bitcoin beach wallet and so how mm -hmm. much uh have you guys been working alongside with them like how much assistance have they given you what's the situation like there did you get in touch with them uh, to discuss it in first yeah oh yeah yeah so uh, let me i'll answer that question let me let me back up a little bit about you know my the the entryway into my podcast and my my books because it 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 provides a segue into this this project because um, because of my faith background, being a Christian, um, I know there are quite a few uh, Christian Bitcoiners that I saw on Twitter, but I didn't see a lot of information or resources for the Christian to think in terms of Bitcoin. And so that's, I started writing because I saw a lot of similarities between my faith and Bitcoin. And which is kind of, it may seem odd if you've not heard that before, but I was definitely seeing it. And for me at the time, I thought, wow, this is really strange. Uh, I even, you know, I prayed about it. I was like, Lord, this, this is kind of weird. Is, is this right for me to be thinking like this? And finally, I decided, okay, I'm just going to write about it. So I started writing on Medium and got a fairly good response out of Medium on who, who saw my articles. And then I wanted to go kind of talk, uh, get on podcast and talk about this Christian perspective with, with Bitcoin. And I had, I introduced myself over Twitter to Jordan Bush. And so I uh, found a, a like mine there, but um, it's, it's really through my writing, through my podcast that I started formulating, you know, how this could be done in Guatemala and, and ultimately how the community, how the community could get involved. I knew um, having spent that time within the Bitcoin community, that Bitcoin is a community and, you know, people who go rogue um, don't get very far in Bitcoin. I think that Bitcoin's all about um, getting people involved. And, and um, so I, that was another reason why I spent time um, doing my podcast. I wanted to bring awareness to this, this concept and have people come along beside me and, and help. 
So then along that, that journey of, of kind of discovering what was going on um, with Bitcoin Beach and who was involved in that project, I met um, Chris Hunter of Galoy and uh, he invited me to come down to Adopting Bitcoin last year. And then I connected with the Ebex Mercado guys and they also invited me to come down to uh, uh, San Salvador. And so I went down there and I had... Um, already planned to go to Guatemala about two weeks after that meeting. But I went down there to meet those guys, tell them what I was doing, make sure that, especially with Ebex, it's like, okay, I'm going to be in your backyard, so to speak. want to make sure that, you know, if I'm in country and I need support, you know, there's somebody I can call and, and get help or, you know, as we're deploying, you know, whatever wallet, we hadn't made a decision about a wallet yet, whatever wallet we decide to deploy, um, are we going to have the technical support or the back end support to make sure that it, that it's a, a success. And then went to El Zante, saw what was going on there and interviewed Mike Peterson for my podcast. And I guess one thing led to another and ultimately decided because of the functionality of the Bitcoin Beach wallet, the, the map feature, which is, I think, a, a tremendous selling point, uh, especially if you're trying to introduce the uh, Bitcoin into a community. And if those, uh, those of you who don't haven't used the Bitcoin Beach wallet, there's a couple of unique features to it. One is there's a map feature. So you can zoom in on a map and you can see that, okay, in El Zante, this business takes Bitcoin, or in our case, in Ponichel, this business takes Bitcoin. And so when you're trying to onboard a new business and they're skeptical, which they all were, I mean, we were literally in a almost digitally naive environment in, in Pana HL. But, you know, if you could show a map of all these businesses that are accepting Bitcoin around you, that's, that's a really compelling um, sales tactic, so to speak. And you can't do that with the moon wallet and you can't do that with the blue wallet or wallet of Satoshi. With those wallets, all you can say is, this is a Bitcoin wallet and all these people around you are using it, but you don't really have any proof. So the map feature in the Bitcoin Beach wallet is really important. And then the, the username in the Bitcoin Beach wallet is really important, almost like the Strike app. And so, um, but one of the pain points that we figured out pretty quickly, and, and we knew this going into it, but um, the there is no national currency conversion to the Kitsal in the Bitcoin Beach wallet. So it was USD and Bitcoin, and that was it, because uh, El Salvador is a dollarized economy. And we decided we we're going to push past that. And it turned out that it wasn't really that big of a deal. Most people, if you're a business owner, you're pretty good with numbers and you can do a currency conversion pretty quickly. So that wasn't that big of a deal, but it was, a, it, it was kind of a pain point. And obviously, the, the other major issue is volatility, uh, which we, we'll talk about as well. But Galoy has ended up being a really good company that has supported our efforts um, just on the back end. You know, if we have questions about, hey, you know, the wallet's not doing what I want it to do, or we need to add this business to the to the map. They've been very, very supportive and helpful. So there's no financial commitments or anything like that. But I think as a team, they're they've just been a very responsive uh, team, and that and that's that's been really helpful for us. Uh, Patrick, I wanted to ask you. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I'm also a Christian. Um, I think one of the main criticisms Bitcoin gets from the Christian community is that it's potentially like a mark of the beast, cashless society kind of thing. What's your rebuttal to that? I'm really interested to hear you. Well, I actually wrote a chapter on that. So there, I wrote a, a chapter specifically on, with for most people who, who are listening and don't know, I mean, Christians, obviously we come from a certain worldview and we, we think a certain way. Um, and that's not good or bad. It's just the way it is. And so with that comes a certain amount of Christian FUD. And one of those is the mark of the beast. And, you know, I'm, I'm older than both of you. And when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, the mark of the beast was the barcode. So um, that that was just that was Christian FUD back then. Right. So the I, I think that to answer your question as succinctly as I could. Why is it not the mark of the beast? Because it's completely decentralized. It's not about control. It's about freedom. And um, if you believe in Satan, if you believe in the mark of the beast and the end times, that's all going to be about manipulation, control and, and centralization. And, and Bitcoin is the complete antithesis to that. So that's that's the very short answer to that question. Yeah. 
And that answer makes me feel like it's yeah, almost like the complete opposite of the mark of the beast, and almost like a defense towards it. I guess. I mean, I don't know yeah. too much about it. I mean, I uh, I wouldn't consider myself a Christian. I'm almost probably jealous of Christians, in, and I know jealousy is a sin, but whatever. Um, because of the the faith side of things, that I just don't necessarily have in my life. But um, yeah, it definitely it's interesting to see different religions as well. Like I know um, I see things how there's like uh, Islamic. Uh, oh, what's the word? high up people in islam i can't think of the right word right imams, now imams um, imams imams and things say like oh that it is um it's like permitted and things like that because obviously some people are concerned within their different religious communities right like mm-hmm. um so they'll look for for guidance uh, from imams and, and and i'm sure in other religions it's the same thing um so it's interesting to see yeah people say like whether it's haram or not in islam and, and similarly in other religions um, i think rabbis have co-signed it too like from the jewish religion as well right and i, yeah, think- I was asked yeah Oh, no, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was asked that by uh, Cedric on his Cedric Youngelman on his podcast, The Bitcoin Matrix. And, you know, when I as when he asked me that, I thought, well, that's a good point. But I think that it doesn't matter. We we can debate, you know, our faiths and, and all that. And that's been done through the centuries. But for the purpose of this discussion, I think what's important to understand is that Bitcoin's good. And it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you're a Buddhist or you're a Muslim, you're usually seeking a higher good in your life and you're seeking order from chaos. Um, now, we can debate, you know, which one's right and which one's wrong, but in essence, you're, you're seeking a higher good. And I think certainly Bitcoin can be adopted by every single religion because it is a higher order. It is a higher good. And I don't think it's contradictory to any religion, um, but in fact, my second book, the, the Philosophy of Bitcoin and Religion, specifically addresses the marriage of Bitcoin and, and Christianity and how they're completely in uni- unity. So um, that, that, that's a, that was a fun thing to write about. And that was actually a, in response, actually, to John Vallis's work. And I just got to the tipping point of like, oh, OK, I've got to I've got to respond to this. So I ended up writing a book about it. And, and he's only there's only one um, he's only one example. There are several other people out there. I think of um, I, I, I'm blanking on the names, but there are several other people out there. Kaysen, Eric Kaysen and Vallis and uh, Farhas that are pretty militant atheists and their views uh, and i don't john Vallis is not a militant atheist but the other ones uh come across as like that but anyway the um my my goal with the the philosophy of bitcoin and religion was to go through logical proofs and demonstrate how christianity is in line with bitcoin and in fact bitcoin can prove the existence of god so that's what i did in that book 